Hello, friends, doctors, specialists, anyone joining us for around the world for this discussion on the science of sleep apnea and its connection to mental health and dentistry. We are now live, and I see there are many of you already logged in and ready to go, and I want to hear where you are joining us from. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know where you are watching from, what your area of expertise is. It really helps me facilitate the conversation when I can see your comments coming up on the screen and when you introduce yourself. And often what happens is when you introduce yourselves, colleagues from around the world are watching the comments as well and going, oh, I know that person. Oh, I've worked with that person. So please go ahead and um, give StreamYard permission to use your name. StreamYard is a broadcast technology that we are using today for this discussion, and uh, I want to hear from you. Hello to Isabel's family. Um, welcome to you watching on YouTube tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time that you're taking for this important discussion. I know there's many, many more of you, and the numbers are climbing by the second, so say hello I want to hear from you. I know that Dr. Cooler wants to hear from you, as does Dr. Tamari Height, who has been with us for every single broadcast. We will be, there we go, Brenda Jungworth joining us from Edmonton. Brenda, it is always great to see you um, and have you with us tonight. There you are, Moeller Wrangler, Wrangler, pardon me. Hello from St. Louis. How are things in St. Louis tonight? What's the weather like there? We have Sherry Klein joining us from um, Arizona. Sugarland, Texas, Isabel's family. That's where you are joining us from. Thank you all so much for introducing yourself to all of you joining us, still logging in. Let us know where home is, where you're coming from. <laughs> Moeller Wrangler says it's hot. It is hot in St. Louis. Are you serious? Is it hotter than in, Zer in Arizona? Usually Arizona gets all the heat right now. 91 degrees. Whew. That is nice and warm. I love it. I love that you're sharing tonight. Everybody, please continue to do so. We are just uh, giving um, our, our audience time to log in to get settled before... We begin and introduce our guest. Hello, Taria from Toronto. How are you tonight? How are things in Toronto? Sherry Klein has beat you, Moeller. It's 112 in Arizona. That sounds like one of the hot spots. My goodness. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. What's the weather like in Toronto, Ria? Let us know. Who else is logged in and ready for this broadcast? welcoming each and every one of you. And like I have said, the best part about these broadcasts is when you weigh in with your thoughts and your feedback and your comments, because our experts appreciate it. They get an understanding of what you want to know about and what areas of concerns you have. So please, this is most beneficial when you engage and make it like a conversation. So don't be afraid to weigh in with your thoughts, your feedback, where you're joining us from, because I know that our experts appreciate your comments and your questions as well. It helps them learn. It helps them grow. It helps them tailor the information that they're bringing to you. Uh, JLB from, let me see, from Hallandale Beach, Florida. All right. We have a little competition going. What's the weather like there? What's the temperature like there? So far, Sherry Klein says 112 in Arizona. What's it like down in Hallandale Beach, Florida? Let us know. It's fun. As you all are getting settled, uh, I mentioned to make sure if you're watching us on our broadcast technology, StreamYard, to give StreamYard permission to use your name. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you would just show up as Facebook user and um, introduce yourself, get engaged in this conversation. We have a lot of information to cover tonight. Grace. 
Grace Garcia is joining us from Clearwater, Florida. Dawn Stroshin, if I said that, uh, Stroshine from Wyoming, 98 degrees. Holy cow, all of you across the United States, there's a, a heat wave going on where you're joining us from. This is fun. It's always good to see what the weather is like down there. In the interest of time, we have a lot of information to cover. Please keep your questions and your comments coming. I will work them into the conversation as our guests and our experts are presenting tonight. But in the interest of time, I want to get going as you log in and get settled. So on that note, I say to our dentists, our doctors, our researchers, and scientists who are joining us from around the globe, welcome to our sixth live broadcast in our ongoing series about the science of sleep apnea. Every few weeks, we welcome doctors and dentists from different disciplines who share their expertise in the diagnosis and the treatment of sleep apnea. And tonight, as I mentioned, we are digging into sleep apnea and its connection to mental health. Did you know that a lack of sleep and mental health are directly related? One has a dramatic impact on the other and creates a trickle-down effect on how you feel during the day and on your ability to perform, on your ability to think and succeed on a daily basis. I'm so honored to be hosting this live interactive discussion with Dr. Atul Cooler and Dr. Tamari Height, who will address sleep apnea from their respective disciplines and also also talk about the importance of collaboration between medicine and dentistry, along with options to treat obstructive sleep apnea. Dr. Cooler is a psychiatrist and sleep specialist specializing in the integrative management of obesity, sleep, mood, anxiety, and attention deficit disorders in adolescents and beyond. Dr. Tamari Height is a general dentist who has successfully reversed sleep apnea in her patients and assists medical doctors with airway treatment. This is your opportunity to find out the connection. And tonight, you will also get a better understanding what your role is as an advocate for your own health and, of course, the health of your patients as it relates to sleep apnea and mental health and wellness. So far in this series, I'm really proud to share this with you because, as I mentioned, this is our sixth live broadcast. We have interviewed a cardiologist, a neurologist, a sleep specialist for both adults and pediatrics, a primary care physician, and a specialist in internal medicine. Tonight, as I mentioned, general dentist Dr. Tamari Height, along with psychiatrist and sleep specialist Dr. Atul Cooler, will discuss the impact of mental health and medical and dental collaboration regarding the diagnosis and treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. We will dig into this information and talk about groundbreaking technology that can change the face of public health and ultimately can save lives. Collaboration is just so key in the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. If dentists and doctors collaborate, the impact on patients who have sleep apnea is astronomical. Essentially, it can be eliminated. So on that note, I want to say hello. My name is Carrie Dahl. I was a longtime television medical reporter and six o'clock news anchor turned public speaking coach and podcast host. I am honored to serve as your host for tonight's live broadcast. I do want to mention that we really appreciate the time you are taking out of your busy lives to listen to and participate in tonight's broadcast and to learn more about the incredible work that is involved in diagnosing and reversing sleep apnea. As I mentioned, we want this event to be as informative and as interactive as possible. So please, I really want to encourage you to get engaged in this conversation. I will read your questions and your comments as they come in. You do not need to wait until the end of this broadcast. If one of our experts is presenting and they say something that twigs a question in your mind, go ahead, post it. I'll bring it into the conversation and they can address it in 
real time. And as I mentioned, make sure that you give StreamYard permission to use your name so that I can allude to you. And chances are either Dr. Tamari Haidt or Dr. Cooler will know who they are talking to. So the format for the next 60 minutes will look like this. I will begin by interviewing dentist Dr. Tamari Haidt, who is the driving force behind these broadcasts and on a mission to increase more collaboration between dentists and doctors in diagnosing and treating sleep apnea. Dr. Haidt is based out of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. She will discuss her research, the novel approach that she uses, and of course, her incredible results. Then we will be joined by Dr. Cooler, a psychiatrist and sleep specialist, who will explain how the two are connected and of course, the impact on mental health. There's a lot to cover tonight and research in this area is saving lives. You will hear more about that momentarily. We're going to wrap up this live broadcast at 6.30 Mountain Standard Time. If you have to leave early or if you want to share this broadcast and this conversation with someone who was not able to attend and you know will benefit from it, a recorded version of this broadcast will be available on the website, thescienceofsleepapnea.com. I'll be going over that website many times throughout the evening so that you know where to go to for more information at the end of our discussion. So with that, let's dig in, shall we, by welcoming Dr. Tamari Haidt, who, as I mentioned, is a driving force behind these broadcasts and so determined and so passionate about fostering more collaboration between doctors and dentists in diagnosing sleep apnea and saving lives. Dr. Haidt has spent the last 25 years working in general and craniofacial dentistry and lecturing worldwide for 10 years to dentists, to orthodontists, and to medical doctors on her published research and her findings. As I mentioned, Dr. Haidt has successfully reversed sleep apnea in her patients, and she will dig into those findings as well. She is also on a relentless mission to get dentists and doctors to work together on the diagnosis and treatment on sleep apnea. She is also writing a book. She's very busy with that as well about her research, and we will discuss that as well. On that note, and without further ado, what a pleasure it is to welcome Dr. Tamari Haidt to our broadcast tonight. It is so great to have you back and to be on. Can you believe it our sixth live broadcast already thank you carrie yeah it's it's incredible um this is number six and yeah. i'm just honored to have these amazing speakers join us I, I agree, and I'm really looking forward to tonight's um, topic because I think so many people are going to be able to relate to it, especially during COVID times. But we will dig into that more with Dr. Cooler. I want to begin with you talking about you and your patients and this removable dental device that can change the jaw and change the bite. So can you begin just by, do you have it there? Can you show it to us and, and what it looks like? Because a lot of people are like, what is this? How does it work? Oh, the um, well, um, the device itself, is that what you want to take a look yes. at? Yes. Okay. So um, here it is. Uh, here, it, it's just a, a piece of plastic. I can put it, I have it, in, in my mouth, just like that. Okay. <laughs> And you can hear that, you know, when you wear this, you slur and drool. And sometimes mm -hmm. you can have a dry mouth. And if you can imagine this, you can have both. So those are kind of the side effects of it. And uh, as I'm going to show you, it actually can grow the jawbone. And so when that happens, a person can get spaces between their teeth. And then, you know, uh, then you can close the spaces with orthodontics. But the reason you wear it, I, I have a patient I want to show you. The reason you wear it, uh, you can wear it uh, because because you have headaches. And that's why this patient came to me is she had headaches. And if a person has headaches for a long, long time, they can get, you know, some mental health issues. Uh, but many people just hide those um, mental health issues. And I started doing Beck's depression surveys in my clinic. And, and I was, um, I don't know anything about them except that it has a number and I like to measure everything kind of before and after treatment. And mm -hmm. um, it's interesting what you notice about these patients, but uh, she just came to me for headaches. And if you look at her anatomy before and after treatment, this is 18 months of treatment. 
And I got to tell you, her headaches were gone within the first three months. And I just didn't know why it was working. So I had a group of about 12 patients and um, they all agreed to stay into treatment for 18 months, bless their hearts, because I wanted to see why this was working. And we gathered a lot of data before and after treatment. So you can see the change in her face. And what happened was we grew her upper jawbone and that's called the maxilla. And, and you can see it there because uh, before treatment, her teeth are very crowded because the, the maxilla, you know, is the bone that holds those teeth in and it's not very big. And, um, you know, after you can see that uh, her teeth are now straight, but I got to be honest, when we uh, developed her bone, which we didn't know we were doing, we were just trying to get rid of her headaches, which is how it, it, it worked that way. Mm -hmm. But she had crooked teeth with spaces. And so then it's very easy in phase two to, to close the spaces. But then the second thing you should notice is that um, in before treatment, she has a double chin there. And her weight didn't change at all. But the reason she has a double chin is her bottom jaw is trapped backwards behind the small upper jaw with the teeth sticking out crooked and it's trapped backwards. And so, you know, once the upper jaw is developed, there's now room for the teeth and then the bottom jaw can come forward and her double chin went away and her symmetry improves. Like we find, you know, a lot of people become more symmetrical and, Essentially, the, the thinking is, is they reach their genetic potential, which is to have jaws big enough to house all 32 teeth. And that includes the wisdom teeth. And there should be no crowding and the bite should not be deep. You should be able to see the upper and lower teeth uh, when the person bites together. But Dr. Height, how can this help headaches and then even reverse sleep apnea? Well, um, I can show you, well, first of all, um, it's just one option uh, to help with headaches. Uh, in medicine, um, there's medications to help headaches. And this was uh, shown to me by Dr. Kalemski in New York in 2019. I was lecturing uh, with, you know, some specialists, you know, five other doctors. Mm -hmm. And um, he showed me the top 10 drugs that they use um, to treat people with chronic headaches and, and pain, craniofacial pain. And the people you see there in red are, are uh, the people these drugs did not work for. And the people you see in blue are the drugs that are the people that the drugs did work for. So medicine has a 25%, uh, you know, success rate, you know, according to this, this paper. And uh, we did a snapshot of in time of the results coming out of uh, my clinic and seven other clinics in the United States and 80% of the patients were getting better by 50%. And we were actually measuring um, using, you know, HIT scores. And then of course, um, uh, I can show you how it might be affecting sleep apnea by, by we could look at the, the anatomy and how it relates to sleep apnea. Okay. So uh, when, when you grow the upper jaw bone, um, when you grow the upper jaw bone, the, uh, the whole upper jaw grows and that includes the nasal airway and the upper jaw bone grew by 1.8 cubic centimeters of bone volume. And we measured that using cone beam CT. So it was very accurate. And the nasal airway volume grew by 2.5 cubic centimeters in this group of a dozen patients whose pain went away. And we know pain is closely related uh, to uh, you know, obstructive sleep apnea. And so when the upper bone is bigger, you know, and uh, the bottom jaw is allowed to come forward, then the second part of the airway that opens up is in the neck there. And so when this craniofacial anatomy is, is more stable, we can actually measure its stability using biomedical instrumentation. So uh, we can measure the muscles of mastication using EMGs and, um, we can find the physiologic rest position of the mandible according to the posture of the jaw of the body. And the slides you see flying in and out there, that's from Matt Walker's book. And he taught, he's a neuroscientist from Berkeley and he wrote this great book. I love it so much. Um, Why we sleep. I'd recommend every dentist read that book because okay. just like we have anatomy and physiology in our jaw area, so does the brain and the sleep. And so this shows like sleep architecture and um, EMG. So Dr. Singh, who uh, 
piled all this stuff together. You know, he worked with Dr. Dement and uh, he was the, the medical doctor that sort of uh, discovered EEGs or, or, or REM sleep, I guess. And then, you know, the anatomy goes to the sleep architecture. And then, you know, uh, we can look at the sleep drives and different things um, related to sleep. And the way I think of sleep and from an anatomical and physiologic point of view, I don't know if it's in my imagination, but, um, you know, if we can stabilize the craniofacial anatomy um, and open up the airway and then the patient has better sleep, that might describe and we might be able to measure um, improvements with treatment. And so the dentist, this might be a dental solution for, for a medical problem. So uh, just to show you a few of the dental statistics, um, uh, we have... Um, you know, we grew the maxillary bone volume by 1.9 cubic centimeters in adults, average age 38. And we had a 60 year old in that study with a P value there of 0 0.02. So that was published in 2014. And then again, part of the maxilla is the nasal airway. And um, that's the next one. And it was, uh, you know, we grew that by 2.5 cubic centimeters of bone volume. And it's published in in this paper here. So, um, you know, this, this is a huge discovery in dentistry because we're taught in dental school that you can't grow the maxilla in adults, but that was a null hypothesis that's now disproven. And you can do it with uh, uh, just a dental device, a device I just showed you. So um, that's basically how uh, the headaches kind of relate to maybe sleep apnea and kind of the way I see the science behind it. It's very, very exciting. It's exciting and it's a really a big deal for the for the dental industry because the impact can be enormous. Talk about that. Well, um, yeah, and as a, you know, I was a nurse for 10 years and a dentist for 25 years and I can't help but nurse my patients. But basically, you know, what, what has, has that got to do with the teeth? Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna show you this patient here who I screen every single patient that comes into my dental office and I thought she might have sleep apnea and imagine my shock when her AHI, that's the apnea hypopnea index, that's how many times she stopped breathing an hour, was 118. So like 30 is severe. So this is like four times severe sleep apnea. So uh, right away I called the medical doctor and we got a level one sleep study. And um, yeah, it was 128. So they, they got her on the CPAP mask and everything. And this is where I love to collaborate with medicine because I think medical doctors need to diagnose this systemic disease, but they can give their patients an option for a dentist to take care of it. So the way a dentist sees it is by teeth. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, we can think of the teeth like a garage and the tongue like a car. So when you look at this patient, here, this is published in how I did this is published in a, a, a sleep journal. Uh, we, we brought her AHI down from 118 down to one. Uh, and that sleep study was done with, with no CPAP and no dental device in the mouth. What we did was we developed her craniofacial anatomy. So when you see her teeth, when she was at 118, uh, you know, on the left there, her bite is deep, meaning her top teeth overlap the bottom teeth. Uh, you know, by about 50%. So she essentially had a garage with a six foot ceiling and uh, you can see her bottom jaw is farther back. And so it's like the garage for a smart car. And then after treatment, you know, there's a 10 foot ceiling and you can get a couple stretch limos in there. And then when you look at her from the front, you know, she's got a one car garage and then after treatment, it looks like a two car garage and, and you'll notice a gap in there and things like that. You know, this case isn't finished. And and so this is phase one. Phase one is like, you know, let's take care of the patient. Let's take care of the craniofacial pain, the sleep, get them to maximum medical improvement. I call that baking the cake. Let's, let's bake the cake. Then we let the cake cool. So once you get them there, you get your sleep study, leave them there for a bit, make sure it's true and everything's stable. And that physiologic rest position of the jaws maintained by the posture of the body and then you can go and ice that cake. So that's the pretty part. The icing is a pretty part. That's the teeth. And then the orthodontist then can, can use their mechanics to line up all the white things so that their cusps and fossas interdigitate. And that's phase two. So um, that, this is uh, very, very exciting for dentistry. 
It is. It's a new big deal for dentistry because in so far in your research, you have successfully reversed sleep apnea. Well, yeah, you know, in my clinic, um, these are, this is a snapshot in time, um, you know, before and after treatment uh, with this protocol. And the dark blue uh, column there are all the patients with severe sleep apnea. And then the, the, you know, less dark is moderate. And then there's mild. Before treatment, they all had sleep apnea. And this group of patients after treatment, you know, all the severes shrunk down and it all poured out into the other columns. And the light blue are people that had normal AHIs, uh, you know, between zero and five. And these reports were done and read by board certified sleep specialists. And, and basically um, this, this chart is so much more than, than just the, the dropping of numbers. Um, you know, some of those people that still have severe sleep apnea in there, you know, a 76 year old lady who started with an AHI of 90 you know, she ends up with an AHI of 30, which is still severe, but her quality of life just improved immensely. You know, she was then able to wear CPAP and, and things like that. So I love to collaborate with medicine because, uh, you know, a patient is different when their sleep apnea changes, you know, maybe their medications need to be adjusted or they can have kind of a healthier, healthier life. So um, I think there's a really big impact on, on mental health and um, some of the things, and I'm so excited to hear uh, what Dr. Cooler has to say and, um, and, uh, Bring you know, <laughs> I love and, and I'm going to get to him momentarily, but I, I want to ask you this where you said you love the collaboration. Yeah. The collaboration really sure. is key to, to tackling what you say is like a secret epidemic, right? Yeah. I, I feel like it's a secret epidemic. I think, um, you know, when some of the other webinars we were doing, uh, some medical doctors aren't that comfortable with, you know, diagnosing or what are our roles in this? And we're just all figuring that out. And uh, I love working with some of these uh, top people like Dr. Cleek Kashida mm -hmm. from Stanford and things like that. Like we, we want to help our patients together and medical doctors and dentists. And I want to, I want to show everyone Dr. Singh's book that was just released. It's called, uh, you know, pneumopedics and craniofacial epigenetics and it's biomimetic oral appliance therapy for pediatric and adult sleep disordered breathing. And the foreword was written by Dr. Cleek uh, Kashida. So uh, this book just came out. It's phenomenal. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to have some of my work in, in this book. He's brilliant. Um, he, he's got training from uh, in medicine, dentistry, and, and just like, um, you know, just the science, uh, he seems to put these three areas together. And he describes the concepts so beautifully, uh, that we sort of already know, but put it all together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my book is going to be like, how does a general dentist, like a regular old general dentist like me, how do they do this in their clinic? How do they screen for patients? How do you, you know, do that and go do a filling and then go do root canal and, and whatever else. Um, you know, that, that's what my book's going to be about and how to collaborate with medicine and, and support each other um, through to help society and help our patients together get better. Especially, I, I kind of want to know from Dr. Cooler, like, how can we work together with psychiatric patients that are, can be very, very complex? They've had a lot of things happen in their lives. And, uh, you know, if somebody lives with chronic pain, I can give them trigger point injections and things to get them out of pain just for a minute so they can catch their breath while we develop them and, and things like that. Like, how can I work with them and, and they're experts on and helping these patients with medications and things. And, and I'm very excited to see, uh, you know, how we can collaborate on that. And I'm going to allow you to ask him that question. Before I do, I just want to make sure that you were talking about Cleek Kashida. And for those of you who weren't able to, my banner is not coming up here, but there we go. We did have uh, Dr. Kashida as a guest. I think it was our second broadcast, uh, yes. Dr. Height. So for any of you who have not seen that broadcast and you want to, to learn about it or listen to it, go to the science of sleep apnea.com. That is a great one where you can watch it again. And I also, I'm going to bring this out. I also want to bring in a really good comment before I let you go. This is from Sherry Klein and she wants to know, are you doing any collaboration with myofunctional therapists and our Buteco, if I'm saying that correctly, breathing yes. techniques due to the low tongue posture and mouth breathing. Dr. Absolutely. Height. 
this is a team sport and the myofunctional therapist is in there and Dr. Singh talks about it in his book and basically the, the whole group of us can all, you know, do our thing to help these patients and all of it impacts it, impacts a patient. So it's very gentle development and we're literally allowing the genetic potential to be expressed in the person. Like, so we get a new phenotype that's stable, that has an airway and, and, you know, then they get pretty teeth and, and uh, you know, they feel better and look better and sleep better and, mm -hmm. and the, the whole bit. So, and it helps with, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease, like Dr. Guaneri, Dr. Mimi Guaneri, mm -hmm. that was our first broadcast. That's right. So, so yeah, it's, it's kind of neat uh, how all encompassing it can be. And I think for public health, this is huge. Uh, if we were able to drop the AHIs in people, you know, maybe people could uh, have their surgeries in outpatient clinics, like these small, you know, remove a mole off the foot or whatever in an outpatient clinic. You know, if somebody has severe sleep apnea, they can't go under a general anesthetic outside of a hospital. It costs their society like billions of dollars. So uh, I think this this public health I issue, and it, that's why I call it secret epidemic. It's just yes. such a humongous thing. But we got to start taking bites out of it, and I think dentistry is key because we can access all the all the population at the regular dental checkups. I think everybody likes what you're having to say. Sherry says yay, and we have a happy <laughs> face from from Kay as well. On that note, Dr. Height, I love your passion and your commitment to making a change and to increase collaboration. We of course look forward to your book, and I know you have questions on Med Sleep, community sleep clinics. He has also worked with the Canadian Winter Olympic team in the past. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Atul Cooler to our broadcast. It is so nice to have you with us this evening. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Carrie, and uh, thank uh, Dr. Height for uh, and you for putting this forward. And uh, like you said, success mm -hmm. and uh, really important information. Happy to be here. Oh, I'm looking forward to digging in. I want to begin just with a, a general feeling for the landscape uh, right now. I mean, we are living in the midst of COVID. We're still not totally out of the woods. I'm curious how it has impacted your practice. And of course, sleep apnea, what kinds of numbers are you seeing? What are you dealing with? You know, that's a great question. I think from a mental health point of view, the mm -hmm. summary I say is, you know, some people are, you know, are doing a bit better, you know, some, but most people are doing worse for multiple reasons. So, but people are very resilient. And I would say, but if we look at the averages, everyone's about 20 to 30% worse, but then there's 50 to 60% less resources. They're not seeking out medical care. They're trying to seek out mental health, get mental health care in a system that's full. And, you know, so it's, it's just a lot of stress from multiple factors that has just made everything that more intense and with less resources to deal with it. People have lost their ways of coping and, you know, they're trying their best, you know, but I think this is the other secret epidemic that's going to follow the pandemic is this sort of surge of mental health mm -hmm. and uh, sleep apnea definitely will be one sort of factor that's actually very easy to treat that can really improve people's mental health. Oh, without a doubt. So talk about that now that if there's going to be this surge of mental health issues, which we've all heard so much about, talk about the connection between sleep apnea and mental health. So basically, this they uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but they share a lot of symptoms, and um, you can see in, on some of your previous uh, seminars, which I would encourage people to look at. You'll see about me has lots of problems, of cardiovascular complications, metabolic complications. What we're going to focus on today: neurocognitive complications, such as mental health issues. You can't think as well. You're tired. You're fatigued. These sorts of things. So moving on in terms of. Um, um, you can move on to the next slide. Uh, you know, sleep concerns are all layered, you know, and you can see there in the middle that the primary sleep disorder, you know, of sleep apnea being one is nested into that patient's sort of experience. Genetic factors, circadian rhythm difficulties, mood, anxiety, ADHD, various mental health issues. We're seeing a lot of post-traumatic stress type symptoms with the pandemic, pain, you know, Dr. Height mentioned chronic mm -hmm. pain. And you can see how the sleep apnea carry is nested into that, but sometimes that's the thing that needs to be addressed first and then poor sleep behavior and stress. But sometimes you can get improvements both ways, bi-directionally, you know, downwards to the other symptoms and upwards to the behavior and stress once you get a hold of the sleep apnea. So mm -hmm. it really depends on the patient. 
because it's a vicious cycle. You know, you have sort of mood and anxiety, and then you have sleep disruption and sleep apnea. What's chicken and what's egg? What's wheels and what's engine? You know, and this, you know, and it's in it can be very complex and someone may not be ready to deal with the mental health issues and maybe ready, more ready to deal with the sleep apnea. And sometimes that can give them, you know, the wherewithal, as Dr. Height was saying, uh, to further deal with some of the mental health problems and maybe not take care of them all, but improve them vastly. Okay. One of the things you talked about um, is what's chicken and what's egg. So how can people tell if their mental health issues are causing their sleep apnea and their tiredness? What's the connection there and what can we spot? Well, you know, I think it comes down to how long they've had them, right? You know, and have they gotten worse? So usually what we see is they'll have a previous pre-existing mental health problem and then the sleep apnea will make it worse. So if it gets worse out of nowhere, uh, that can be sleep apnea. But if it's sort of and we'll go over more of this, but if you have sort of the core sort of, I can't think, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, you know, I feel like crying all the time, uh, you know, it's probably more sort of the depression or mental health issues. And sometimes you just simply need to be assessed for sleep apnea and try to treat the sleep apnea. Uh, we see a lot of people that have both and we often ask them, what would you like to do first, right? And, you know, um, that's sometimes the best way to figure it out, you know, because you can see in this slide, you know, we all traditionally think of sleep apnea, at least medical doctors do, as someone who looks like Homer Simpson, you know, big, obese, male, eating a donut, where really the people that get missed, as Dr. Height will tell you, are people that don't have great airways, you know, they have an overbite, and then you can see that, uh, you know, Bart there is quite grumpy, has meant maybe having some mental health issues, and mm -hmm. it could be some of the sleep apnea driving the bus. So when we look at this, and the association is quite strong, uh, Carrie, it's basically if you've had a previous sleep apnea diagnosis, you know, you have 5.2 chance if you're, uh, 5.2 greater chance, uh, times greater chance of having depression if you're a woman. Or even if you just snore or stop breathing a few times a week, you can see three for both men and women. So there is a clear bi-directional association between sleep apnea and depression. Mm -hmm. So moving on, yeah, and if we look at the risk factors and just go through the slide, there's the traditional risk factors that medical doctors are taught. You know, age you can see there, and you can see the this is the likelihood or the greater times risk of having sleep apnea if you have these problems. So you can see male gender slightly over one, so a small risk, but you know, uh, not a big one. Obesity, which is categorized in this study as a BMI over 30, you know, double the risk, unsurprising. High blood pressure, about a 50% greater risk. Age starts about age 40, 45. And as you get older, you mm -hmm. can double or triple the risk. And then you can see there at the end, depression, six times the risk. Wow. So you can see these tight connections between the two. And I would argue that everyone, especially if they have some of these other risk factors that has depression, needs to be screened uh, for sleep apnea in some way, shape, or form. And it may be part, I mean, all their depression. And it works the other way around. These are people that were diagnosed with sleep apnea. So you can see there people who had anxiety only, about 19%. People with depression, about 8%. Uh, people who had anxiety and depression, 30%. So you can see more than half of these people uh, that had were diagnosed with OSA also had anxiety and depression. So you can see how close the chicken and egg connect here. And it's tough to separate because as you can see here, they overlap in symptoms. You know, you get people who are tired, can't concentrate, mm -hmm. irritable, you know, um, gain weight, you know, it could go either way. And so one way to tell uh, to your previous question is um, the depressed patients, you know, they might have more of the sadness, the guilt, the agitation, um, that nothing is fun anymore. Whereas mm -hmm. the sleep apnea one would drift more towards sort of the snoring, the witnessed apneas, the snorting arousals, the headaches, the jaw clenching, some of these dental things, which Dr. Hyde had mentioned is, you know, um, that the, a regular dental appointment uh, should pick up as well. But you can see that a lot of it's an overlap. But the best way to think about it is there's a bi-directional relationship between depression uh, and anxiety as well as sleep apnea. Okay, with that overlap, though, which one should you treat first? And that's and it really depends on the patient, right? And it depends on the severity of both, and it depends on the patient's choice. You know, so if you are too depressed to get out of bed, to do a lot of other things, then yes, the depression needs to be treated. However, if it's kind of mild-moderate, maybe better to treat the sleep apnea first. 
and like I said earlier, it depends on the long, how long standing it is, right? If it's long standing, mm -hmm. probably reach for the depression. But okay. usually you don't, it's not one or the other, but treating one really helps the other is a better way that I could explain it. All right. Okay. Because if we look here, um, if you have fatigue with sleep apnea and the red bar is how much was related to depression symptoms and the blue bar was how much related how bad your sleep apnea was. So what's interesting is if you are more tired with your sleep apnea, which uh, it, it might actually be, and it doesn't get better, or if you just have so much more tiredness, you know, that may be another way to tell that maybe depression is lurking around as well. Okay. I'm curious. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'll let you talk about this first slide, and then no, I'll no, go ahead. No, well, well yeah. let's uh, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let's take your point right now, and then we'll go to the next. I, I wanted to ask though, like with with treating it, what can medications cause sleep apnea? Yeah, you know, uh, some medications definitely can, right? You know, um, sedatives, uh, higher doses, uh, but the number one cause. And this is another secret epidemic to continue that sort of analogy mm -hmm. uh, is, and it's a dirty little secret. We've all heard about the opioid crisis, yes. right? you know, yes. ad nauseum, but opiates can really mess up your breathing. And that is not well known, right? And not well looked at. And that's probably the number one, two and three medications that disrupts your breathing. So if you are an opiate painkiller, most of them, uh, it may be affecting your breathing. So that's where this chronic pain problem comes in. They get the opiate, then they stop breathing, not stop breathing, and they get more tired. So I'm, I'm talking about that in adults. Can we talk about that in children? Because there's so many children. Does the same apply for kids who are on Ritalin? Should they yeah. be on Ritalin or should they just be perhaps screened for sleep apnea? And is the that's Ritalin right. making things worse? That's, that's a great question. So moving to that slide, next slide now, that, that's a, thank you for the segue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, cause there's a big link, especially in children with obstructive sleep apnea and ADHD, because, you know, if you fragment the sleep, if you lose oxygen, you can have the exact same symptoms, Gary. Um, you know, and even if you snore, you know, they even don't have sleep apnea. People have more sleepiness, inattention, and hyperactivity. And again, this is a bi-directional relationship. Lots of things in healthcare are bi-directional. And the sleep disturbing rarely causes full-blown ADHD, right? And usually causes some symptoms. But if something is not clear, it should be looked at. And the Ritalin won't necessarily make it worse, but it may be masking the real problem. And sleep as a whole needs to be looked in every child with ADHD. Now, you do see this in adults as well, but this is a much more stronger correlation in uh, children. Mm -hmm. And tonsillectomy, and as Dr. Height probably has written in her book, uh, dental treatments uh, can improve cognition to these children to the point where they may not necessarily need the medication. This one's a little more direct than I think the depression one. Uh, because they are younger, they don't have years of it, and especially if it doesn't quite fit sort of the ADHD pattern, or they don't respond to the treatment, they definitely have to be looked for for sleep apnea. So which opens the door to the, okay, go ahead and talk about rating scales. I have so yeah. many questions, but go ahead. But I think this is one way to your point earlier, Carrie, to tell. And then, you know, looking at rating scales, you know, as best we can, you know, Dr. Height said she liked to measure everything. But we look at short patient-related scales, such as for depression, such as for um, uh, anxiety, such as for, for numerous other things. You know, we may be looking for bipolar as well. These things, and then we also look for sleep apnea. So your pattern on the scales, as well as ADHD, as well as for insomnia, binge eating as well. That's also very common with obesity and sleep apnea. So you can see you need sort of a, a, a sort of a battery of small, short patient rated scales. And depending on your various levels of those, that will often depend what drives the bus. So if we see somebody very high in the sleep apnea, kind of lowish on the depression and anxiety scale, we're going to attack the sleep mm -hmm. apnea. The flip side, we may leave it up to the patient, right? And so there's a lot of overlap, but this is to your point, one of the key ways that we would work with the patient to decide you know, what to do first. Well, it is a key way as you're talking about, but how do you get screen tested, assessed for sleep apnea? Because in the it, even with the medical doctor, they are just so busy. What is your take on that from your, your discipline? 
Yeah, and it would depend on the region where you are. It's a, it, this is the problem is the variability, but always looking to order some sort of sleep test. You know, you, we order blood tests left, right, and center. So looking at ordering some sort of sleep testing. You know, they may not everyone necessarily needs to see sleep specialists, but a good starting point is, and this is just a straightforward screen for sleep apnea, these are very common symptoms of them. And if you have four or five, this warrants some sort of testing. So that would be the starting point. And, you know, not everyone needs to see a specialist. Sometimes they have to go to the clinic for the testing. But the first question is, you know, the, for the medical doctor or even the dentist, have you tested for this? Have you looked for this? Because if you don't look for it, you won't find it. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be the one way to do it is to get the doctor or the dentist to work with whatever, whatever, however works in their regions to get the patient tested for sleep apnea. Okay. I love the screen, the stop bang. You want to walk it through that? Yeah, sure, definitely. So this is, again, eight of the most common symptoms of sleep apnea. This is a very well-validated scale. So you see the big four, which is snoring, tired, observed apnea, and hypertension. So if you have a couple of those, that may warrant a test. Now, there's some secondary ones. Now, they wanted to make their study look better. Their BMI is greater than 35, age is greater than 50. But in reality, where sleep apnea starts to really take over uh, uh, numerically is BMIs of 30 and ages of 40. And neck circumference doesn't really add that much. So, you know, it just wastes, you know, some time. So I would actually drop that and make this the stop bag. Because often, you know, with virtual care, you're not seeing the patient, you may not be able to measure the neck, right? You know, these sorts of things. But the point is, if you have a number of these, you should strongly, strongly consider testing that patient for sleep apnea. The testing for sleep apnea, in your um, professional opinion, is it happening enough in different disciplines? Uh, I think in pockets it is, right? But I would say as an answer, no. And the second point is I don't think the treatment follow-up is that's also lacking. So even when they are testing well enough, they're not interpreting right, not pushing it forward. And this is where dentistry and collaboration is important. So there's two types of studies. There's the full sleep study, which is the traditional one, and the home sleep study, which is mostly for just looking at sleep apnea, yes or no. So if we look at this, most people will have gotten a home study in most jurisdictions. The problem is if that's negative, that doesn't mean it rules it out. That just means it's less likely. So understanding the linkages of moving on to full testing and not just stopping with a negative home test, I think is really important. So other points about this, uh, can we go forward with the slide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the test often rules out things that are inside your sleep versus external. So another way to differentiate between mental health and uh, sleep apnea or sleep difficulties, if the sleep study is fairly normal, then we may want to look more at treating the mental health. So that can be one way, you know, deciding where to go depending on the testing. And as you can see there, the interaction between testing, treatment, follow-up, variable by region and clinic. And as I said, this isn't sort of a be-all, end-all. You know, you don't necessarily, just because you have a negative test doesn't mean you don't have, may not have problems. It's less likely, and the full tests are better. But these testings are very contextual and requires clinical correlation. One of the major points I'll make, and I'm sure Dr. Height would echo this, the severity of sleep apnea does not correlate to how tired you are in any way, shape, or form. It correlates to how bad it is for your heart, but I, we see people day in and day out with mild, you know, barely their sleep apnea. It's just disrupting their sleep so much and creating a cascade downwards, especially if they already have mental health problems. And it's only a one night sample. So understanding these caveats, people want this def definitive thing. And, you know, it's still a, a contextual test. And there's newer technologies or wireless, less intrusive, but they haven't sort of hit prime time. But they have, you know, some of our, you know, um, people who've tuned in from the States may have much more experience with them. But in Canada, it's still quite limited. Our audience is so quiet. I think they're busy listening to you, Dr. Cooler. Usually there's like comments coming in left, right and center. I'll, I'll let you continue here. Yeah. No problem. So if we look at sort of, and this is where I think everything has fallen down. Yes, testing, and you should test frequently, but you know, every, it's you know, I think we're a little too CPAP dominated because that is the traditional treatment. But the oral devices, the de the role of the dentist has improved vastly in the last ten to fifteen years, and their predictive values, and there's so many more sleep dentists trained. You know, it used to be that CPAP was one and dental stuff was two. I think they're one and one A, depending on the patient and what they want to do. The 
the problem, the limitation, if you ask me what we could you know, do for mental health patients is get them better dental coverage, at least in Canada. Because that is probably the number one reason people don't go primarily to the dentist. Mm -hmm. Like yes, there, you know, access is improved, but simply put a lot of health cut plans or dental plans simply don't cover a lot of this. And I think that is the barrier we need to work forward because it is a real treatment because only 50% of people will use CPAP successfully, mm -hmm. right? And so that leaves another 50% of people uh, that are untreated and surgery is very hit and miss. Um, you know, you can see there soft tissue surgery, nasal surgery, um, you know, full out, you know, oral surgery where they break the jaw and move it forward. And we have to remember CPAP treatment's only 40 years old. They used to give, put, uh, put a hole in someone's trachea they had sleep apnea and that was as recent as the late 70s wow right and so. to, to see the progression and the changes and now hopefully more collaboration that is the key in 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 diagnosing and moving forward and in the interest of time on that note i can see dr tamari height in the yep. green room and i know she wants to hop in on this conversation she's been nodding away so i'm going to bring her into this conversation yep. and and dr height I, I know there are several questions that you want to ask of dr cooler so go ahead oh well thanks so much for that presentation that was amazing um, I agree with you that uh, this, this is uh, more of a public health thing. There's so many people that can't afford, um, you know, the dental. They don't want to go to the dentist uh, because of cost. But if we can show the amount of money that could be saved um, in, in our healthcare system, if we're able to actually reverse sleep apnea, and especially now that we figured out how to reverse it, we, we know how to prevent it in children. So uh, essentially, um, you know, I, as a dentist, I just want the kid not to have braces because it's so expensive to get braces. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. doing all these things to develop their jaws, yet the nurse in me is sort of looking at their medical history. And I always tell my friends, the less you ask your patient, the healthier they seem. So I found like some of my kid patients, you know, they, those, those wild ADHD symptoms go away with simple little dental treatments to open up their garage. Uh, kids stop wetting the bed, um, different things. Uh, they start talking. Um, you know, we'll do a lot of tongue tie releases. And so sometimes if the kids can't talk, the sleep and language therapist will send them to us. And, and it's like their tongue isn't tied. But if we can put risers on their teeth and they, they have, uh, you know, they just start talking right away. I'm kind of thinking, you know, that that it was maybe undiagnosed sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. But what's really cool now is you mentioned some of the wireless technologies and there's this great technology, uh, Vivo Score. It's powered by sleep image. It's 98% correlated to the uh, polysomnograms, the in-lab tests, and it's coming out. I have it in my clinic. It's so cheap to do it. It's $5 a test. So I'll send it home and the person can have three, four nights in a row. A two-year-old can wear it. They can pass it around the family like it's a ring. And uh, I went and got my husband went and got this gray cup ring. I I got from uh, yeah. You were talking about being the dentist for the Oilers and things, and or the medical doctor for the Oilers. And uh, I'm the dentist for the Eskimos. And we did a little research store um, uh, study on those guys showed how the bite affects blood flow to the brain and we built a physiologic rest position bite in all their mouth guards and that year they won the great cup so they gave me a ring <laughs> ah, <laughs> so it's you. anyways um you know all these things that we can do to help the kids just try to avoid braces and grow their jaws so big they don't even need their wisdom teeth out i call it shooting for the moon like do you get there i don't know but at least the rockets pointed in the same in in the direction and you know, if we observe some of these changes we see in kids, it's it's really dramatic. And Dr. Height, can you address this question from Sherry Klein, who says, how often are CBCT scans done to check airway diameter? And what about tongue tie release? Um, I do cone beam CTs if somebody's going into treatment so I can measure before and after and get a diagnosis of exactly what I want to do. So uh, many times, because a lot of my patient, my dental practice now is 100% airway. I don't even do fillings anymore. <laughs> it just happened. Mm -hmm. um, I like the tongue released um, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of research at Stanford. You know, the tongue is when it's free, it will develop the maxilla to its genetic potential. 
And, um, you know, I've probably released uh, 4,000, almost 4,000 infants for an ectomy just so they can breastfeed. And the moms come in and have it done. Just we get a 78% reduction in symptoms of lacking of breastfeeding, uh, you know, the symptoms the mom has and the baby has. And it's a simple laser um, for an ectomy on infants. But, uh, you know, not all the time you got to work with mild functional therapists. But when the tongue is free to fully function, to swallow forwards, to function normally in the mouth, it should be up in the palate, free to develop the maxilla. And that's part of this treatment. Uh, it, part of this treatment, this dental device, uh, you know, helps to train the tongue. There's the little mm -hmm. thing the tongue plays with. <laughs> so it's just kind of physiology and we let the body develop itself. So... Dr. Cooler, I'd like you to address, because I know Dr. Height talked a lot about collaboration and how important it is in diagnosing and treating sleep apnea. But from your perspective, how do you, how do you, what is the best way to approach collaboration from your perspective? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And again, it really depends on what's available in sort of the region. You know, um, I think, you know, a group of as we've seen how multidisciplinary this is, right? Uh, a group of people in this area really kind of need to kind of band together and obviously have treatment sort of algorithms and plans. It's just a little too hodgepodge right now. And uh, I think uh, a, a big issue is, you know, presenting it to uh, the sort of the uh, medical doctors, sort of the family doctors. But I, I think partly there's, it's two pronged. One is, you know, the lack of awareness. And the second part is, um, you know, uh, from, you know, medical doctors as well as dentists. And then the second part will become, you know, the coverage. A lot of this stuff, you know, for example, um, people on, um, you know, social services or uh, um, uh, handic uh, handicap disability, mm -hmm. there's a pathway for them to get CPAP, but there's no pathway for them to get anything else. Right. Yeah. So that I think is what's really limiting collaboration is the fact that the, most of this does not fall in the public domain. Right. Mm -hmm. Unless you're with a research study or a specialized clinic. And that's what really limits collaboration. But I think what we can do is make people aware of these sorts of treatments and the options for them. And so from your perspective, Dr. Height, what would you need then, according to what he said, from psychiatrists for collaboration? Um, well, you know, I guess, um, you know, if we share a patient or something like that and we can have a chat on the phone or something like that, I would just call, <laughs> I guess. Um, and I don't know how that would work, but cause a lot of it's, it's one thing if I'm calling a cardiologist to ask if it's safe for me to do something, but it's another thing as psychiatric patients are so complex, it's not a, a short call, I think. And so, um, I don't know. I think there needs to be an assessment in, in public health in Alberta healthcare. Um, you know, if we're working collaboratively to treat a medical condition, dentists uh, maybe have to be compensated uh, by Alberta healthcare so that the patient, uh, you know, has that option if it's, you know, a viable option. So I think, uh, you know, I have clinical trials going on right now in, in my clinic on children and, uh, you know, if this is going to be covered by medicine, that would help a lot of kids that, you know, whose parents can't afford treatment, which seems cosmetic because mm -hmm. it's dentistry, but it's, it's not that we're helping these kids AHI. Yeah. And Go you ahead. make a good point. It's very, it's classified as, as cosmetic. And, you know, I think this is the limiters, but I think the one thing we can do, that's a long-term system thing, but I think the one thing we can do is just make people as aware as possible of these various options. A lot of these people aren't aware of these options, you know, and to me, I think the sleep dentists have to kind of, you know, almost band together in a sense is like, we're going to offer this and this and that. And I, I think there's still too much difference, difference of treatment. Right, you know, yeah. and and, and the, the, it's it's a consistency issue, right? You know, certain and, and so we need to kind of dial down about clear pathways, right? So, for example, I have a clear pathway of who gets sent to dental, right? But I don't think most other people do, or they don't even open that discussion. Most medical doctors send to the CPAP company. What is your clear pathway for uh, to dental? Because there's going to be medical doctors watching this and maybe they could copy. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, basically you offer it as another treatment option, right? Yeah. You know, you basically diagnose the sleep apnea. 
the level of it. And there's nothing really in psychiatry that would preclude you from doing anything dental unless they don't like something in their mouth or they're really anxious, right? If you're going to treat the sleep apnea, it's the same principle as CPAP. It's basically what pathway do you want to go down and what pathway do you have coverage for? And I don't think that is well known enough. You know, it's CPAP or nothing, right? You know, but giving them that option, seeing if they have the coverage um, is probably the, a very simple algorithm. And a lot of it is beginning here with talking about collaboration and educating colleagues uh, in this area about the options that are available and that this is such a viable option. Dr. Cooler, some closing thoughts tonight as we wrap up. Uh, I think generally, you know, I think sleep apnea impacts mental health and we need to look both in uh, conjunction. They may not be ready to treat it, but it is something that needs to be reviewed pretty well in any case um, that has significant mental health issues because the symptoms do overlap quite significantly. And I think the second point is all treatments should be offered uh, to all people, whether they want to go do them or can afford them or not. It's a different story. Uh, so I think those would be my sort of closing summaries. I'd like to thank you both for having me and thank you all for tuning in and spending part of your evening. And uh, I'm honored uh, to be here on the series. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooler. And Dr. Height, your closing thoughts tonight? Um, yeah, I'm going to echo Dr. Cooler. Thank you so much for coming on. Your presentation was amazing. Um, I, the opioid thing is, is great. As dentists, you know, we see people just going through life. They come in to get their teeth cleaned, just regular folks go off the street. If we can help them prevent, prevent, you know, sleep apnea or mental illness or chronic pain and those kinds of things, just little things, uh, you know, they're medicating themselves uh, might make it worse. Just knowing those things, uh, your information has been great. So thank you so much. And, and I know the, the audience has loved this as well because they've been unusually quiet, but here comes the thanks right now from Harmony Myofunction Therapy saying thank you to you both. And um, I would like to say thank you to you, Dr. Cooler, and to you, Dr. Height, for your time and your expertise, your passion, and the education that you brought to this discussion. It was just a thought-provoking discussion that needs to happen. I appreciate you both. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. And on that note, once again, if you are a dentist or a doctor and you do have questions and you want to get trained in this area, we do have help for you. So here it comes. We're going to put these up on the screen for you. One of the ways that you can go for answers, probably the best way, is the, the airwaysummit.com. Um, and also, if you want to use the code COOLER, that's Dr. Cooler's last name, all in capitals. It's spelled K H U. L-L-A-R, you can get the course for free. That is seven hours of instruction. You can get trained in this area. Just go to airwaysummit.com. And also, you can also learn more by going to the American Academy of Sleep uh, Medicine. That's www.aasm.org. Lots of information there. And also, as always, if you want to learn more, you can also go to vivoslife.com. There is a load of information there. And if you missed this broadcast tonight and you want to share it with your friends, with your colleagues, check out the website, thescienceofsleepapnea.com. All of the broadcasts to date, all six broadcasts, loaded with so much uh, discussion, information, education, scienceofsleepapnea.com. That's where you can find it all. To all of you who joined us from across the United States, Canada, and beyond, thank you so much. The thank yous um, are pouring in right now. Uh, no, it's K-H-U-L-L-A-R is the code word that you want to use. Christy Bumford is saying thank you for a fantastic presentation, studying to become a myofunctional therapist. Uh, Moeller Wrangler says thank you. This this was great. Alex says, thank you for the presentation. Um, lots of um, Leanne says, thank you so much, Dr. Coolers, and has other questions. You know where to find these experts. They are more than willing to help out um, in any area that they can. Um, and as always, so many coming in are just, I can't keep up with them all. She said, Pearl, this is a great way to sum it all up. Pearl Maxwell says, absolutely awesome. Thank you all.
Dr. Cooler, Dr. Tamari Height. Thank you so much for the time, the expertise, and to all of you joining us from around the globe. We appreciate the time that you are taking to learn about this and, of course, collaboration with each other. Bottom line, when you do, you save lives. I felt so honored to be able to facilitate this um, discussion, and it is having an impact. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Take care. Wish you the best in health, and have a great evening. Bye-bye.